what happens is that we've traveled literally around the world, 80 countries, talked to 7 million people. And what we've discovered is that they're wonderful people, talented people, educated people, personable. But the difference between those who have a little success and those who have a vast success is the ability to ask. We find that in our lives, we find it in their lives. And so we wrote this book called Ask, the bridge from your dreams to your destiny. And Gene, what we discovered is everyone has a great destiny, but most of us haven't done the three categories of asking. We say, you gotta ask yourself, ask others, and then ask God, and have big lofty and inspired goals to go for the gusto and get to your destiny. Each of those channels that we discovered is equally important to ask yourself, ask God, ask others. Um, but, you know, I think it starts with asking yourself because you can't begin to know where to go until you know where you are. Welcome to Grow Think Tank. This is the one and only place where you will get insight from the founders and the CEOs of the fastest growing privately held companies. I am the host. My name is Gene Nevin. I help leaders and their teams navigate the defining moments of their growth. Are you ready to grow? Today we talk about creating your destiny, living your destiny. When you can take your dreams and make them your destiny, you have a very powerful effect on not only you, but those around you. In leadership, we are creating destiny for ourselves, but we're also creating a destiny for others. We have very special guests today. They are the authors of Ask, the bridge from your dreams to your destiny. We have Mark Victor Hansen and also Crystal Dwyer Hansen. They are the authors of this book, uh, you may have heard Mark Victor Hansen before. He actually is one of the co-authors of the Chicken Soup for the Soul series and many, many other books. Um, but today we talk about destiny. And the one thing that you have to do is ask. You have to learn to ask yourself, ask others, but also just truly get beyond just you know what is it you should be asking for. Some of the simple questions inside here will help you not only be better leaders, but also create the kind of place for your people to love to come to work. One of those questions is, what is your definition of happiness? We talk about that inside the full episode today. Before we get there, let me pause for a second. If you haven't already downloaded the training to help you be better leaders, to create a team of A players, make sure you go to genehammett.com forward slash training. It's up for a limited time right now so that you can actually get this training absolutely for free. Just go to genehammett.com forward slash training. You do want to be a better leader, right? Now here's Crystal and Mark. Mark, Crystal, how are you guys? Wonderful. Great. Thank you for having us, Gene. Yeah, doing fantastic. Happy to be with you. Well, excited to have you here on the podcast to talk about um, an interesting subject that I think we all intertwine with about you know, really getting what we want out of life. You've got a new book coming out about called Ask. I, I always love to ask authors, why did this book have to be written? What happens is that we've traveled literally around the world, 80 countries, talked to 7 million people. And what we've discovered is that they're wonderful people, talented people, educated people, personable. But the difference between those who have a little success and those who have a vast success is the ability to ask. We find that in our lives. We find it in their lives. And so we wrote this book called Ask, the bridge from your dreams to your destiny. And Gene, what we discovered is Everyone has a great destiny, but most of us haven't done the three categories of asking. We say you got to ask yourself, ask others, and then ask God, and have big, lofty, and inspired goals to go for the gusto and get to your destiny. And Crystal, when you think about this book had to be written, like what really allowed you to put your heart and soul into making this book happen? Well, I know that every time in life that we uh, that I've personally experienced a setback. Um, or a problem, um, some kind of tragedy, the only way I was able to come out of that stronger and better was by asking the right questions. And I think that always starts with that introspective journey, which is the ask yourself part. Each of those channels that we discovered is equally important to ask yourself, ask God, ask others. Um, but, you know, I think it starts with asking yourself because you can't begin to know where to go until you know where you are. And so we say there are like three critical phases to the ask yourself part. Um, and that is, first of all, where am I now? You know, you can't go anywhere until you understand where you are. You know, how did I get here? What happened? What did I miss? What do I like about what's going on or not like? How, how do I feel differently today than I did before? And then the second critical phase of that is where do I want to be? 
Because a lot of times, Jean, people, people like success keeps eluding us because we don't have a clear, clear definition. We haven't asked that question. Where do we want to go? Where do we want to go? Where do I want to go individually? Where do we want to go as a couple? Where do we want to go as a team? That is so important. If we haven't clearly defined those, you know, again, in our, and we like to kind of start with the end in mind, like what is the perfect definition of success? And then engineer it backwards with all those sub questions that come underneath. And then the third um, critical phase of that ask yourself part is what specific action do I take to get there now that I've defined where I want to go? Well, I appreciate you bringing us into this world. I, I want to make sure we tune the audience into uh, Mark's longtime work. You were working with Jack Canfield on the Chicken uh, Soup for the Soul series. I don't know how many books you did in that. Was it 25? <laughs> we sold 500 million books. We did 254. We're in 48 languages. And we got two major movies coming out. When COVID ends and all the movie theaters open, our movies will show up. And I think they're going to be really popular. And they'll sell more books because my goal, and I'm asking every one of your leaders, as big as they're thinking, to think bigger because the world is either going to be employed or unemployed. And it's going to be employed by people like you've got that are little shots and become big shots because they keep shooting. And I redefined team once as an acronym, together everyone accomplishes miracles. And Gene, I believe right now you're doing the greatest work getting people to wake up to the miracles inside them and do more entrepreneurship, which I define as finding a problem, solving it for a vast profit. Hold on for a second. Did you catch what he just said? Think bigger. Well, what does that mean for you? Well, a lot of time what gets in the way of thinking bigger is you trying to figure out how to get it done. What if you don't need to know how to do it today? Well, the how is what gets in the way of us thinking bigger sometimes. We have to go beyond the, the normal aspects of what we know how to do today, what we have skills for, what we have a network for, and think about what we really wanna create. Some of the biggest things in the world were created when people didn't know how, but they just wanted it. So I'm gonna remind you, if you think bigger today, you don't have to know how, you have to actually suspend that and then think about something that you don't know how to do. That will activate you to another level, but also activate those around you. Those are the people that will help you make it all happen. And the best of all, you can figure out how to do it together as a team. That is something that you really wanna do when you think bigger. Now back to the interview with Mark and Crystal. Well, I want to bring the audience into some of your past work, but I want to dive into some of the elements in the book that would help us today. We can't go through everything here because it's, it's really deep and packed, but you talk about the seven uh, roadblocks for asking. And, and I see some of these coming up a lot within my leadership and the coaching I do. Um, give us one that you really feel like applies to, to the world of leadership. I think um, the two, I, I'm going to say two, unworthiness and fear. Because I think a lot of times we don't step into our full leader, leadership potential because there's this subtle feeling of unworthiness inside of us. And, you know, that just happens over a lifetime. It's conditioning. It's, it's conditioning from our childhood, from our teenage years, from our years on the job. And um, because we all come into this world, Gene, like perfectly equipped to ask for anything, to expect everything, to be wildly curious about everything. You know, as children, we want to know who, what, when, where, why. And we also want to ask for more and more and more. And then over time, that, that literally gets crushed out of us with, you know, you go to school, teachers tell you, don't, don't talk unless you're called on. Stop asking questions. Your parents shut you down. You know, just basic life rejection. And so people literally become afraid to ask. They become unworthy to ask. They stop being curious and questioning everything that's around them and saying, why not? Why can't I do this? What is this? And how can it make me better? You know? I love that. And, and you mentioned the fear. Um, where does that come in? Because I, I know from my experience of leaders actually face a lot of fear because there's some bigger decisions that need to be made. There's a lot of risks that they have to take. Um, but you guys have studied this with millions of people. Tell us a little bit about that aspect of fear. Fear, like she said, these, these seven roadblocks, which everyone's got a few of them, are so subtle. Like we interviewed this great guy, Greg Haig, who had two jets, multiple houses, a lot of motorcycles, travel around the world, made a lot of money. 
but he didn't understand. He owned his own sense of unworthiness, even though he's rich. And all of a sudden, he's reading our book after we'd interviewed him for the book. He's reading Bob Parker's story. It got him so deep. He said, we did an interview with him, and he said, you can't believe it, but I didn't understand how unworthy I was. At eight years old, my father was called Chubby and the biggest realtor in Ohio. And, and I thought I should be like my dad, so I became very fat. I weighed 300 pounds in eighth grade. And he said, I told dad, I'm going to take that girl next door who's just beautiful, and I'm going to take her to the eighth grade prom. And he said, I didn't know I was so lack of worth. Dad said, would well, you call her? And he said, he went upstairs, saw the phone, and he didn't have the guts to do it first day, second day, third day. And they said, the worst thing about being unworthy and full of fear is he said, the fourth day, he said, I lied to dad. I said, I called her and she's going to go with a football player. And the next day she said to me in front of dad and me, hey, why didn't you call me? I was hoping that you were going to take me to eighth grade, eighth grade prom, prom. And it was all that sense of unworthiness started early and he didn't even know he had it. And that's why our book is so good because it asks you to look at your own stuff. And all of us got stuff. Crystal calls it mental excavation. And, and we got to really <laughs> excavate ourselves. Right. And I just want to add to that, Gene, you know, that fear thing. It's funny because human beings, we have this deep need to be loved and accepted. And um, that fear is just really a fear of, of rejection. Okay. So when we're afraid to step out and lead, it's like, oh, I might be rejected or, you know, disapproved of. And so really getting in touch with that and asking yourself, you know, what do I have to lose? You know, what are my greatest strengths? How much more can I gain by stepping into a leadership role? And what kind of transformation might come about if I, you know, sometimes we say you need to literally just step on your fear with courage and crush it because we give so many examples in the book of how when people did that in business and so many other areas of life, when you just are able to understand what your roadblocks are and move past them, the payoff is huge. It's just huge. I want to go a little bit deeper into one of the aspects of the book, because a lot of leaders, I think, are so focused on the work that gets done, the, the milestones and, and metrics of this. And those things are absolutely important. But rarely are they checking in and having real conversations with employees. But there's a question inside your book. I know there's a story that goes with this, but that question is, what is your definition of happiness? I don't, I think that's a question that a lot of leaders are, are not asking that maybe they're afraid to get the answer. What, what, why is that question so important? Well, the man I spoke about, Greg Haig, that's his question. He had all the stuff. He had the trappings, he had the billion dollars, all that. But he went to breakfast with his best friend who is, you know, everybody needs an intellectual interrogator, an intellectual gadfly, an intellectual uh, person that pushes the edge of your envelope. And he said, I just don't feel happy. And he said, hey, Greg, what is your definition of happy? And Greg didn't have one, so he stumbled. And he said, well, what is, should it be? And he says, you've got to be passionately on purpose about something that's meaningful, important, and relevant to you. Passionately on purpose. Holy cow. And he says, so every morning now I wake up and I do that. And in our own case, because we're running a couple of businesses, uh, Chris and I believe that you, we wake up and we meditate, pray for an hour together every day, and we do it again before, out loud before we go to bed at night. And, and what we do is you stay linearly on focus like a laser beam to get everything done for you, your family, your, and our, our grandkids, who are the love of our life. And, and we've got so much that we want to do that you've got to pack it, and you've got to be really good at your segment intending so you overcome that, and we stay happy because – Happy is, is elusive, and happy is, is passionately purposeful, and we're passionately purposeful about like selling this book and loving our kids and loving each other. <laughs> well, I find that a lot of leaders avoid questions like that because they feel like they just don't have time for it. But I feel like that they spend a lot of time focused on things that don't matter as much as that one question. If you want to create a workplace where people are happy and truly are um, doing meaningful work inside the organization. I know That's you guys have run some big organizations. W what are your leadership kind of principles that, that you could share with us today? Right. So what we found in running our organizations is that very thing, Gene. It's really tempting because I'm like, I'm Virgo. I'm like perfectionist. Like, let's get it done. And I know all the organizational, you know, structure to just do it. We need to do this, 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 and this. But what we've learned over time is if you don't take the time to get to know your team and understand what drives everyone 
and understand how to tap into that drive, you won't get anywhere. You won't have this cohesive, passionate team that can really make a difference. They'll show up for work, but you're always going to be hounding them with your to-do list and, and, and you just don't have the buy-in. And so it really starts that time you take with your team where you sit down and you ask these meaningful questions. You have to get to know your team. What, what is important to you? You know, what, what is your life purpose? You know, what are you here for? All these things. What are you good at? It's interesting when you go around your team and say, what do you feel like you're good at? You know, and what do you get excited about? Are the things that are tasks that you do that make you feel like you're in touch with your superpower and how do we support that? Is there, is there an area you feel weak in and, and you know, what, what makes you feel victorious when it comes to accomplishing things as a team? And is there any way that we can, um, you know, have a dialogue with each other every day that supports that? I mean, so many questions, but we do that. We make that mistake, not just with our own team and our own employees, but we make it when we're out, you know, with the client and we, there's a great story in there by Preston Weeks about, you know, how to beat out the big behemoth. Um, but it's all about, you know, going in with an agenda. It's sort of that same principle. We go into business with this agenda and we forget to ask, we forget to be curious. We forget to um, generate and, and stimulate dialogue that would help us perfect our offering so much and perfect um, our team so much. You go into a company and say, here's what we have. We're the best at this. We do this, we do that. And this is what we want to sell you today. And often we forget to, to just ask. And so this story is so great because he sits down, he says, you know, the first thing we did is basically quickly go through our um, capabilities and skills as a team. But then we just shut up and started asking questions. What are your pain points? You know, what is your biggest priority right now? What is your biggest challenge right now? If we were to solve that and, and make it 10% better, what would that look like and how would you measure it? You know, and just question by question, answer by answer. In this story, he talks about how the meeting was supposed to be this 15 minute in and out and they went, you know, over an hour and the people didn't want to leave because, you know, this international group they're like, oh, we need more time with you guys. This has been the most amazing thing. They revealed information about their projects that they would never have revealed. So, you know, we did a lot of studies on, in the book. We looked at a lot of studies, I should say, and, and looked at the research. But what it shows is when you're willing to ask more questions, the people who ask more questions, whether it's in business relationships or personal relationships, you, those are the people who are found to be much more likable. Because when you're asking, you're creating a bond. You're literally getting in sync with this person, whether it's your team member or your potential client. Go ahead, Mark. If you don't mind, I want to go back to your last question about happiness. Something that you may not know is that we've been more blessed than ever to win a lot of awards. But last year at Stanford, they give the Happiness Hall of Fame Award, and we got it uh, along with a couple other people. And what's fascinating is the biggest business guys in America that are happy are at Stanford, paid for by Merrill Lynch, the most successful. And, and that is unequivocal now. Now, Crystal just said something really interesting. You've got to take time to get to know your team. Yes, you have to have time for getting the work done and all of the meetings and all the sales and all the customer service and all of the product development. Whatever your business is, you have to take time for it. But as a leader, you also owe it to each one of the people that you lead to really take time to get to know them at a personal level. What are their personal goals? What do they want uh, to create in this world? How can you help them create that? Because if you can be a catalyst to their own journey, their own destiny, which is what we're talking about today, you really have a chance to impact them, not just today, but for the rest of their lives. Now, that is what you're here for. Your journey of leadership is not just to get the work done right now. That's a part of it but it's to grow those people and to connect with them and build a relationship that can't be broken. Now, when you do that, you'll have loyalty, you'll have creativity, innovation, you'll have retention, you'll have people creating value for you, and they will be there with you for the long haul. And when they do find their way out, they'll talk about you with glowing results because when you've taken the time to get to know them, you've taken the time to truly connect 
and lead them in a way that probably no one has. That's my take today. Now back to Crystal and I, I love that research um, and thanks for sharing that with us. You know, a lot of leaders I know will say they don't have time to ask. They, they live in a world where they feel like they're expected to have all the answers. And, and I, you laugh and, and, and they, I, I know the ones who get it because I have leaders that will literally tell me stories about, you know, I could sit in a meeting now because I've created this team and, and I really support them and empower them but I don't have to say a word. They don't have to say, you know, it just happens. They could be there or not be there, but it's because they've, they've been asking, but too many people are afraid that they have to have all the answers. What do you say to those leaders that, that, are, that are living that way? First of all, I love the question. I love that you are a true leader that, that is humble enough to ask, because humble doesn't mean lowly, it means teachable and coachable. And what we find is the leaders, we've won the Horatio Alger Award, which means we've come from rags to riches and been excessively philanthropic and helped thousands and thousands of kids get to go to university that couldn't have otherwise without our money and help and, and mentorship. But that's exactly what we find out. Every Horatio Alger Award, when a rags to riches story, every one of them that we've met, whether it's David Foster, the world's greatest orchestrator, uh, whether it's Ben Carson, the guy who did 15,000 perfect pediatric neurosurgeries and not one person, all of them live in the question. I, 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 I think what you asked, I, I get goosebumps. Now, remember, because you were just with my partner, Dr. Jack Canfield, you know, Jack and I say seven criteria of a chicken soup story, but you get goosebumps, God bumps, or chitter bumps. I think you're revealing the truth of how poignantly powerful questions are in real leaders that have good self-esteem, which Crystal talked to about self-worth and overcoming fear, you know, really are willing to ask the questions and be educable, be coachable. If you happen to be listening on YouTube, I just want to invite you to go ahead and subscribe. If you're listening to this content, you want to be a better leader, you want to activate more growth, this content will help you do that. Just keep coming back, listening, taking a few things that we say, applying them to your business. Let me know what you apply, put them in the comments, I'd love to hear from you. Make sure you give us a thumbs up if you like the content. And wrapping this up, make sure you subscribe. Don't miss out today. Well, I really appreciate you guys being here. I want to give you one more chance. I, I probably couldn't ask you everything that's pertinent to leadership. And I know this is a much bigger book. Um, ask is for anyone who is wants you know, to create and live their destiny. Um, what have I not asked you today that you think is important to this conversation? I would say, you know, never stop asking when you, cause a lot of times when you have a team, you're trying to accomplish things. Um, you might not be successful the first time you might get rejection. And I just love the story we have in the book. It's by a woman um, who's actually a good friend of ours, Rita Davenport. She um, was a very popular um, broadcast journalist here in Arizona. Uh, she ended up getting, creating the most popular cooking show on TV. In fact, it was the most watched daytime TV show in, in the state. And she would invite, you know, Wolfgang Puck and Julia Childs, all the famous chefs. So this just became a really, uh, an amazing success, the show. So she had this fantastic idea. She put the business plan together. She thought, why not create a food network? So she really spent her time putting the plan together. In the meantime, the competitor station, um, there was a manager over there named Jack. And uh, Jack, would watch her every day. In fact, Rita's friends who worked at the competitor station would say, this is kind of bizarre. I think he's really into you because he locks the door when your show's on and he takes copious notes. He's writing everything you say, everything you do. He's obsessed with you and your show. And he has like volumes of what you've done every show. And uh, so at any rate, Rita prepares this business plan, goes to the corporation who owns the, the station and she said, you know, I just have a great feeling about this and I can tell you how this is going to work, but we need to create a food network and um, I want you to get behind me on it. And um, they looked at it and they said, you know, Rita, this is great. We know your show is a, a smashing success, but this is just never going to work. Who's going to want to watch food preparation all day long? That could never, never be successful. So Rita kind of, you know, folded up her tent and left and never brought it up again. She just kind of felt rejected and felt like her idea maybe wasn't valid. In the meantime, 
Jack Clifford at the opposing station took her idea and her show and kept, kept it out there, took it to different corporations until he found the financial backing. And that was Jack Clifford who created the Food Network and which at the time Jack sold his share in the Food Network. It was worth $3 billion. And I think now it's worth way more than that. But I think this is a fantastic lesson for all business owners and entrepreneurs. Do not give up on your ideas and keep asking. Just because you get turned down the first time or you get rejected or the first bank or the first you know, uh, you know, funding uh, source doesn't like the idea, it doesn't mean it's not a great idea. Maybe you just need to ask more questions about it, polish it up, and just keep asking because it might be one of the greatest potential successes you'll, you'll ever have. So we interviewed Rita and she said, everyone's got to get their ask in gear. <laughs> <laughs> well, Crystal, Mark, thank you so much for being here. This has been about the bridge of your dreams uh, to your destiny. And, and the pathway is by asking better questions. Your, your insights have been really helpful. Thanks for sharing your wisdom. Gladly. And if Thanks, everyone Jane. wants to get a book at Ask, we'd love them then to go to askthebookclub.com. It's free. And we want everyone to become a master asker because we think asking is the key to the great journey. And if they want any of our stuff, if they go to my website, markvictorhanson.com, we've got a free book for you or Crystal. Yeah, and I'm crystalvisionlife.com, free audio there if you want to check that out. But yeah, you can get it on Amazon, you know, Kindle, audiobook, whatever. So yeah, and reach out to us. We'd love to hear some feedback. What a fantastic interview. I love talking about some different subjects. The depth that they've done for this research for the book, the stories that they share, hopefully will help you be a better leader. You know, when you think about being a better leader, what does it take? Well, for one thing, it probably takes letting go of where you are today. If you want to try Coaching on for Size, I'm offering for a limited time a chance for you to talk to me absolutely for free. I'm not going to try to pitch you on something you don't need, but I do want to help you serve your customers serve your employees, and become a stronger, more effective leader. If you want to try coaching with me, just go to genehemmett.com forward slash try coaching. It will help you take your business to the next level through coaching that will impact not only you, but those around you. Just go to genehemmett.com forward slash try coaching. Now, as we wrap up today, just make sure you remember when you think of leadership and you think of growth, think of Growth Think Tank. As always, lead with courage. We'll see you next time.